Welcome back! Today we're reacting to Kurzgesagd. Kurzgesagd. Kurzgesagd? In a nutshell, <laughs> they are a great science channel. I've watched some of their videos before. I found them very interesting, very thorough. No video is perfect, but they seem to do a very good job of staying neutral where they can. I haven't seen all their videos, so we're going to check out some of the ones that I haven't seen yet. Make sure to check out the original video. Let's get right into it. Black hole stars may have been the largest stars that ever existed. They burned brighter than galaxies and were larger than any star today or that could ever exist. The scale the of these is just but besides their scale, what makes them Our brains aren't meant for it. We can't even comprehend that. By a cosmic parasite, an endlessly hungry black hole. How is that even possible? A black hole inside a star. How would the black hole not blow the star apart during the core collapse? That's what a supernova is, isn't it? To break we know about I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. They were only possible during a short window of time in the early universe. But if they existed, they would solve one of the largest mysteries of cosmology. Black hole stars were... Is that where supermassive black holes came from? Massive stars today may have about 300 solar masses. A black hole star had up to 10 million solar masses of nearly pure hydrogen. 10 million? Let's take a moment to look at what this means visually. The sun. Okay, you can't see our sun anymore. <laughs> the largest star. I mean. And finally, the black hole star. Oh. Its scale is beyond words. And that's the thing about these scales, right? When you put it in perspective like this, it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of the scale. You know, you can kind of compare one object to the other. But our brains cannot even handle the scale of our sun. You know, I mean, we can build a model all day long and hold them side by side, but our minds cannot comprehend that. We can't even comprehend how big the Earth is in our minds. Yeah, we might be able to recite off um, how many kilometers around it is and its estimated mass and whatnot, but I mean, we cannot actually grasp the immensity, the enormous size of the planet, let alone the star or anything bigger than that. So while it's good for scale, you know, it's just, it's something that we're not designed for, to understand. For 800,000 times wider than our sun, 380 times larger than the largest star we know today. And far below its surface is a black hole, growing rapidly as it devours billions upon billions of tons of matter per second. Wow. Normally, stars are born from gigantic clouds, mm -hmm. collections of thousands or millions of solar masses of mostly hydrogen. In these clouds, matter starts to accumulate around the densest spots inside. As these spots get denser, their gravitational pull intensifies and they grow faster. Yep. Eventually, they generate so much heat and pressure that they ignite fusion reactions and a new star is born. Yeah, it's how a normal star is born, right? Limit on their size. Nuclear fusion releases enough radiation energy that the surrounding gas cloud is blown away. The new baby oh. star can't gather more mass. From now on, the star is living on the edge between two forces. Gravity so during star formation, that whole... And when fusion starts up, fusion outwards, it's an outward force. Okay, okay. And then obviously you got the gravitational force. The runs out of fuel and the balance breaks, destroying the star. Mm -hmm. But black hole stars were very... I believe that's a supernova, right? When that happens? The beasts of the early universe. So how did these guys actually form? After the Big Bang, when the universe was much smaller, all the matter in existence was much more concentrated. The universe was much denser... And, and do we know that these existed, or is this theoretical? ...forming giant structures called dark matter halos. These dark matter halos were so massive that they pulled in and concentrated unimaginably gigantic amounts of hydrogen gas, becoming the birthplaces of the first stars and galaxies. Epic clouds of hydrogen formed, some as massive as 100 million suns. Jeez. Mass of small galaxies. In this just universe, think about that, that, just that much hydrogen. Again, the enormous gravitational pull of the dark matter halos drew gas into its center and created extremely massive stars. The amount of data just in a single cell, you know, if you were to get a single cell, which there's, un there's an unimaginable amount of cells 
in your body, right? Or even just the tiniest portion of your body, say the tip of your finger. There's an unimaginable amount of cells in there. And the data that each cell contains is just, I mean, once again, it kind of goes back to we can't wrap our minds around it, right? And then you think about how many cells there are, say, in your whole finger and then your whole body. And hey, wait, there's seven, almost eight billion of us. There's the planet and the solar system and the galaxy and the local cluster. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, bigger. and every single atom <laughs> that exists in that space has that uh, that same amount or well not maybe the same amount but a ton of information it's just mind-blowing when you think of it just from a strictly informational perspective how much information there must be in the entire universe it's just it's mind mind-boggling as we said before when a star is born it blows away the gas cloud that created it but these titanic gas clouds in the early universe were so large and massive that even after their birth, more and more gas piled on the newborn star, making it grow to unbelievable proportions. The young star is forced to grow and grow and grow, getting more and more massive, until in some cases, it reaches up to 10 million times the mass of our sun. Crushed by gravity, Jeez. its core gets hotter and hotter, desperately pushing outwards, trying to blow itself apart, but to no avail. There's too much mass and too much pressure. The balance is impossible to uphold. Like a supernova on fast forward, the core <laughs> gets crushed into a black hole. Normally, that would be the end. Today, stars yep. go supernova, a black hole forms, and things calm down. But in this case, the star survives its own death. It's, gra it's, it's gravitational force is so strong that it can withstand the supernova of the of the black hole formation. How much matter do you need to withstand that and keep the star in one piece? Explosion rocks the star Jeez. From inside, but it's not enough. The star is so large and massive that not even a supernova can destroy it. But now it has a black <laughs> hole for a heart. It's got to be the only thing that a supernova won't obliterate. Oh, other than a black hole, I guess. The monster grows. The stars are born from ever faster spinning and collapsing gas. And so they also spin. Mm -hmm. When a black hole is born from the core of a star, it keeps its angular momentum. And that's actually, so, you know, once again, keep in mind, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert on cosmology i'm not a physicist or anything like that but this stuff really interests me that's one thing that when you're reading about black holes and you're studying them at like an entry level or maybe even a little further than that i would imagine black holes are described as non-spinning for most examples but they get so much more complicated when you add spin <laughs> and modeling that and, and you know the fact is that probably every black hole in existence is probably spinning because they came from things that were spinning. It's it's mind blowing. This means that matter that gets drawn in doesn't just fall in a straight line, but instead begins orbiting the black hole in smaller and smaller circles, going faster and faster. In three dimensions. Is an accretion disk which of course this is only shown in two. Only a small amount of gas actually falls in at any given moment. Basically, black holes put a lot of food on the table and only nibble at it. Hmm. But the matter trapped in the accretion disk doesn't have a good time. Friction and collisions between particles heated up to temperatures of millions of degrees. <laughs> Actively feeding black holes have accretion disks that are incredibly hot and powerful. And that's um recently here, we just had our second picture of a black hole. What was it about a year ago maybe a little more than that we got our first ever picture of a black hole and in that picture you don't actually see the black hole itself because the black hole is black hole light can't escape it there's no way to see it but what we see is the accretion disk around it and the light that that creates from that matter just getting so hot it's really interesting when you think about it even with the pictures we've taken today we've never seen a black hole we've just seen evidence of it by the accretion disk of that matter getting really hot as it gets sucked in. This heat from the disk further restricts how much a black hole can devour, just like the core of stars. The super hot material creates radiation that blows away most of the food within its reach. So even if a black hole had access to as much food as it <coughs> desired, it can only grow slowly. A black hole okay. inside a black hole star is different. 
the enormous pressure surrounding it pushes down matter directly into the black hole, overcoming all restrictions on how fast it can consume. So it just grows really fast. ...and releases so much energy that the accretion disk becomes hotter and releases more radiation pressure than any star core ever could. Oh. Enough to push back against the weight of 10 million suns. An impossibly dangerous balance has been created. That the black hole is radiating out at that force. ...of a force-fed black hole pushing out. For the next few million years, the black hole star is consumed from within. Wow. The black hole grows to thousands of solar masses, and the bigger it gets, the faster it eats, which heats up the star even more and causes it to expand. I like the little faces they draw on everything. <laughs> than our solar system? ...ever exist in the universe. The intense magnetic fields at its core spew out jets of plasma from the black hole's poles, which pierce through the star and shoot out into space, turning it into a cosmic beacon. Oh, so you get the beacons out of the star, too? Dude, these things are ridiculous. It becomes too stretched, and the accretion disk within too powerful. The parasite destroys its host, blowing it apart. So we get like a supernova after all. In the end, rips its way out to hunt for new prey while leaving behind nothing but a star carcass. So do, the, do we know these exist? Massive question. That's my biggest question out of this. Or is it theoretical? one of the greatest If they exist. Okay, so we don't know for sure then. The supermassive black holes we see at the center of galaxies are just too big. They shouldn't be possible. Black holes born from regular supernovas can be a few tens of solar masses at most. And because of the process we explained before, they grow slowly after that. If black holes merge, they can form slightly larger black holes of over a hundred solar masses. Yeah, and that's that's actually something that I, I remember uh, reading about, maybe seeing, was that when the supermassive black holes, they're just so massive compared to what should be able to exist just since the beginning of time, since after the Big Bang. They shouldn't exist. There, there's not a way that we know of to explain how they got so big. You know, even even merging and everything, they can only get so big by that process in the time that they've had. And we're not off by a little bit. We're off, like, exponentially in the difference between what they should be and what these supermassive black holes are. So it's really interesting that this could potentially be a way to explain that. And it, it does give us a mechanism to get the food for a black hole quickly and, and how to get that in there. Once again, though, I'm not a physicist. Nor do I play one on TV. ...and billions of years to make black holes with hundreds of thousands or even millions of solar masses. And yet, we know that some supermassive black holes already had 800 million solar masses only 690 million years after the Big Bang. Black hole stars are a sort of black hole cheat code. If they formed very early in our universe, and the black holes that emerged from them were thousands of solar masses, then they could be the seeds for supermassive black hmm. holes. These seeds could take root in the center of the earliest galaxies, merging with others and drawing in enough... I love the epic music in the background. Very soon, we may be able to verify their past existence. Oh, with James, James Webb. Webb Space Telescope is turning its sensors to explore the farthest reaches of the universe, looking back in time, back to the early universe that we couldn't see before. So, with luck, we might be able to witness glimpses of these tragic titans in the brief moment between their formation and destruction. Mm. Until then, let's do the visual journey again, just for fun. Uh, that's actually another concept that um, I've had discussions with some people and they've been a little bit confused on how the James Webb telescope can look back back in time so to say it's pretty great because as light travels, it takes time to travel even though it is the fastest thing in the universe it takes time to travel well the universe is also expanding basically as that light's traveling towards us it has to fight the ever expanding universe so there is light from the very earliest moments in the universe that's still on its way to us. Of course, as it travels and travels and travels, that light gets redshifted as it moves down into the lower energy spectrum. 
it's, you know, a lot harder to see and you need special things like infrared and whatnot to see it, but it's there and we can see it. And the James Webb being an infrared telescope can actually see through a lot of like the dust clouds that our light ones cannot see through our light telescopes like uh, Hubble. So we can actually peer way, 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 way back and we can capture some of the light that was emitted during the very, very early universe, further than we ever could before. And that's how we're seeing back in time, is we're capturing that light from them that's been traveling for the, you know, pretty much the entire length of the universe towards us. And when you, when you really think about that, you know, like this photon was generated by a star that has lived and died long, long, long time ago, further than we can ever imagine. And it's been traveling lonely through space just to eventually land on a detector on our telescope. That's actually why I love the, the constellation Cassiopeia. I don't remember off the top of my head what the star is, but it's one of those that is widely agreed to be the furthest star away from us that we can see with the naked eye without the use of a telescope. It, to me, it's just, I love looking up and seeing that because knowing that that photon has been traveling through space for you know what is it 1.3 million years or whatever and that photon came from that star and it's been traveling for over a million years to land in my eye <laughs> so that way it could be turned into electrical impulses that my brain can perceive as an image that's just mind-blowing to me the universe is just stars are big black hole stars bigger Accurate. It's crazy. Isn't Stevenson 218 the largest star that we know of? I want to say that's true, but don't quote me on that. Look at that. Oh. Long-term project like the James Webb Space Telescope requires some serious budgeting. But even personal finances are a nightmare to manage on your own. That's why we want to introduce you to Rocket Money, the sponsor of today's video. Check out their sponsor, guys. Projects are owned by professionals. Your finances deserve professional. Okay, wow, that was that was amazing. I love it. And and the thing about Kurzgesagt, I'm I'm probably slaughtering that name, and I'm sorry for it. But the thing about them is they do such a good job of explaining things, but in a, and I don't mean this offensively, but in a dumbed down way that most people can understand it and follow along with it. You don't need a physics degree. You don't need to be a cosmologist. They, they explain it in a way that the average person can follow along and actually enjoy and take something out of the video. But they give you enough that you learn something out of it too and they keep it entertaining the music is just amazing you know in the background i think that's something that's often overlooked with the kurzgesagt videos uh the animation of course they got they've got their style down uh, the animation is amazing of course then the content of the video is great so overall love this video it was amazing we're definitely going to check out more good job as always to these guys please go support them become a patron of theirs i'm plugging them i'm not affiliated with them in any way but i love these guys and they definitely deserve your support if you can thank you i appreciate you and have yourself a wonderful day